Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I wish you welcome within the uh, project uh, Child Care in Central Asia. Uh, international training program on medical training and education in digital era. Uh, this project is uh, trying to uh, aim for uh, better uh, continuing education uh, of all those involved in child care. Uh, today we are all lifelong learners and definitely uh, we need updating our skills and competences all the time. And I'm certain that our life today uh, would not be possible with uh, continuing learning and lifelong learning, not only in uh, work, but also in everyday life and in, uh, in, in, in uh, our environment. Uh, today, uh, my name is uh, Sandra Kucina. I'm president of European Distance and E-Learning Network Eden, and I will be the moderator of uh, this session. Today, uh, let me just go. This is the web page of the project. So all of you, uh, all of you interested in the project, you can find uh, more information on the web pages uh, of the project. And uh, I'm here also to tell you that uh, Eden uh, is celebrating 30 years uh, of existence and continuous work uh, this year. Uh, as a three decades of serving modernization in education uh, in Europe. And we are happy that we are also contributing uh, with uh, this child uh, care uh, in Central Asia project uh, with our presence uh, and collaboration uh, with the uh, project coordinator and members. Today we are in the webinar number four. Uh, which is titled Continuing Education in Practice as a Tool to Keep Health Professionals Updated. Uh, and uh, speakers today are Tommaso Minerva, Professor, Department of Surgery, Medicine and Dentistry, Coordinator and Director of EduNova at the University of Modena and Reggio uh, Emilia, President of EduOpen and of uh, the Italian eLearning Society, then Stefano De Nicolai, a professor at the University of Pavia, where he's also head of the master in uh, BIBE, director of executive MBA and director of the master in digital innovation entrepreneurship. So I, I shorted uh, your CVs, they are all very long and uh, participants can find them uh, on our web pages of Eden or uh, on the project as well. Uh, then we have Antonio Memeo, Director of Pediatric Orthopedics and Traumatology Complex Operative Unit at the Gaetano Pini Hospital in Milan. Uh, and Stefan Frenet, a Strategic Advisor in Healthcare Industry with long experience in managing marketing and communication of first pharmaceutical industry. So uh, this is an uh, introduction from me. This session is going to be recorded. Uh, the recordings will be available of the, uh, the web pages of the project and also at the Eden web pages. You can post your questions during the session in the chat. So we will see uh, how to uh, reply to them uh, in the due time. Uh, and now uh, I will uh, ask uh, Tommaso uh, as a first speaker uh, to have his uh, introduction into the session. So Tommaso, please. Okay, thanks uh, Sandra. Let me share my presentation if I will be able to find it. Some way should be. Okay, so. So, uh, first of all, let me thank, uh, thank again President uh, Sandra Cucina and also uh, Professor Govoni and Elena Caldirola for inviting me to participate uh, in this uh, webinar uh, series. So, the topic I will cover in this webinar is uh, an upskill and reskill challenge in the digital era tools and uh, methodologies. This, uh, this topic concerns the adoption of a digital approach to continuing medical education, both in terms of updating skills and abilities to uh, 
and, adapt, and adapting to new professional context and thus to need to acquire new skills. So they, uh, just to start, it'd be useful to, to go to line the training process, usually in, in, in Europe, um, of an healthcare professional, a doctor, a nurse, uh, a nurse, a technician, so it includes the first phase of institutional training, a degree, a PhD, specialization, and so on, before starting the uh, practice and the professional life. But uh, the, the continuous evolution of medical knowledge and practice involves also a process of uh, constant updating and also realignment of knowledge and skills. This continuous updating process follow, follows two parallels, but closely interconnected paths the daily professional practice and a continuing educational process. So practice and continuing training and education are the daily life of a medical or, or an healthcare pro professional. But if we try to go a little bit deeper, uh, we can explore the, the field of continuing education. We uh, discover that we have two, um, two groups of, 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 of activities. The first is uh, the, the, um, the activity to update skills and knowledge and uh, uh, what we call the upskills. And uh, to acquire, and the second is to acquire new skills and knowledge, what we call the reskill. Within the, the upskill process, uh, we must consider the fast evolution of practices, uh, technologies, knowledge. While within the reskill process, uh, we must consider uh, facing new and uncommon scenarios new required skills able to modify the professional environment deeply. For example, in uh, 2019, we had no COVID at all, while in 2021, we, had, uh, we have a, a, a world pandemia, we have some new vaccines, but uh, still no, no therapy. So consider how much medical teams had to modify their knowledge, habits, and also expectations. This is a clear case of how, how to rebuild new skills in a minimum interval of time. But a process of, of updating and, uh, and continuing education cannot be an impromptu process. Okay, it can be in an emergency phase, but uh, we must uh, uh, consider to lead this process by expert instructional designers, by expert digital instructional designers. They must have specific skills for training in the medical field, and at present, and even more in the future, with solid skills in digital learning in his methods, in his tools. So I will not spend more time on this. Uh, to the webinar cycle, you had the, uh, the opportunity to discuss how important digital learning is, to explore excellence, uh, uh, excellent and effective methodologies, technologies, and so on. I prefer here to introduce and briefly, really briefly, uh, describe four case studies. Four case studies related to uh, four groups of, of um, building skills. An, a, a, an example related to, to, to skill updates is in the e-labor project, we'll see it. Uh, another project, another case, case study is the GEEC, project is a project on how rebuild skills. Then the master in medical humanities 
And finally, the degree in digital education uh, in medicine. These are two uh, degree program from the University of Modern Reggio Emilia to um, build new professional in education in medicine. Uh, briefly, what's the e-labor project? The, the labor project is a project uh, from the region Emilia Romagna, is the region in Italy where we, we work. And it's a project with um, a, a project who offers open and free courses to both professionals and citizens. While certified courses are, uh, are offered only to professionals with the release of, of an open badge and a certificate at the end of the course, and general courses are promoted to, uh, to the population to help to, um, to reach a, a, a higher uh, health literacy. This is very important now in, in an area of of infodemia related to the, the COVID pandemic. So this is a, a project of a cooperation since there is a very high cooperation among, among all the, the, the health institutions of the, of the region. They are summarized here from, from Parma, Reggio Emilia, Imola, Ferrara, Modena, Piacenza, Bologna, and so on. E, The cooperation is both in terms of um, core co design and also in content sharing among the, the, the eight institutions. Some courses are mark marked as mandatory for employees within each institution, while free courses are uh, for other institutions or for people outside the, the, the health um, institutions. In the catalog, uh, in, with the specialistic course, there are also courses to improve the digital learning skills. So how to approach the to knowledge management, how to use digital technology to improve and validate scientific knowledge, and so on. In one year of project, we reach more than 40,000 users uh, on uh, 30 courses uh, in, the, in, in the whole catalog. So this could be a project referring to a standard digital upskill program. It's, uh, it's very standard. The only uh, peculiar item is the cooperation within a large scale institution. The, the second one, the, the following case introduces uh, an example of how we faced the needs to reskill quickly a group of professionals. That is how to create new skills in a group of non-specialist professionals and immediately place them in an high intensity operating operational environment. So the JIC project was instead a an urgency imposed by the COVID pandemic. During the, the acute phases of, of the pandemic spread, there was a significant shortage of professionals able to operate in intensive care units and emergency department. The JIC pathway built an instant education project and prepared doctors specialized in not intensive care, such as general, general care, pediatrics, dermatologists, ophthalmologists, and so on, to operate in intensive care to support specialized teams. It was a joint project uh, of the four universities of Emilia Romagna, the University of Modena Reggio Emilia, the University of Bologna, the University of Ferrara, and finally the University of Parma. So the training project started with, uh, with online asynchronous lectures, about 40 hours of lectures, 
on different topics related to the uh, to the uh, to the covid pandemia followed by a week on uh, on field training in an emergency room then they were ready to 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 work in 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 the emergency in the emergency department so it was a real instant education project we recorded all the lectures in october 2020 we use the modify big blue button uh, plugin for Moodle to um, separate the record of video and audio tracks. Then we post produced the, the, the lectures. The path was published in November 2020, at the beginning of November 2020. Why? At the end of November, beginning of, of December, we had, an, we had another pandemic shock here in Italy the second wave, followed by the March 2021 third wave. So we were really on time to prepare this group of, um, of doctors, of specialists, to, to help the, the, the emergency departments. So the program is still online and active while we are, we are planning to update lectures and also to open to general audience. Uh, so another case of introducing new skills is the master in medical humanities. Master in medical humanities is a, is a cross between medical sciences and humanities. And uh, the underlying principle is that clinical practice must consider the human aspects of relationships, communication, narration, ethics, and cultures. The goal of the master programs is precisely to integrate medical and clinical skills with, with humanities, with uh, psychosocial uh, uh, consideration, and to consider the, the, um, this skill as a, a part of the, of the medical treatment protocol. See, considering the, the um, the patient in, in an holistic and a complete vision uh, with, with medical uh, treatment and also some, some holistic environment uh, with a, a psycho, social, uh, well-being, uh, lifestyle, helping the patient to, to recover from the, from the illness. Uh, finally, the the, the last case study is the degree program in digital education in medicine. This, this is a, a full degree program in, in, uh, to set education experts with specific skills in the education of healthcare profession. They will, will have uh, there will be specialized people with skills to design and lead paths of continuous updating. So they, they have skills in, in pedagogical and methodological learning science. They have skills and competencies in, in pedagogical design, in methodological learning, in, in communicative relational, in, in organization institution uh, topics. They have skills also in information communication and management of information communication technologies. They have juridical competencies and also quantitative, quantitative skills. But mainly they, they, their profiles are cut to fit the, 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 the management and the design of education in a medical and a healthcare environment. So in, in conclusion, uh, just two, two messages. First message is that digital learning can be useful and effective in many cases in updating or, or upgrading skills or rebuild skills for medical professionals. But we need to develop a new profile of digital learning aspect, mainly devoted to face the needs of expertise in continuing education in medicine. I thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Sandra. Thank you, Tommaso. Very interesting and important conclusions. Uh, maybe just to, to uh, 
emphasize a little bit the existing experience uh, so far gained during the, the COVID. Uh, we have uh, definitely gained uh, important experience. How do you think you, you will uh, be able to integrate uh, all those experience gained so far into these uh, programs uh, you are going to develop? Okay, so we, if you mean, uh, so we are working on, uh, on building a, a continuous education program within the degree in, 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 in digital education in medicine. And uh, we are starting to think to uh, integrate in this degree also a pathway related to, uh, to emergency management, where emergency is also emergency in education. So we are facing a strong emergency in education or in Europe and in the world. So we are considering to, to include, uh, to build the skills to facing emergency in the medical area, which emerges in terms of knowledge and practice, but also to face emergency in education. That's very important for us. Now. Thank you. We have a question for you from Stefano. He asked uh, the courses on digital learning skill has similarities the faculty, with the faculty development programs we spoke about in one of the previous webinars, but looks directed to a more broad audience. Is that correct? In contrast to the, oops, sorry, I just skipped in the, I have a small computer this time, sorry. Okay, I can read it. <laughs> yes, can please. Read it. Uh, yeah. Very long question, but, but in reading. Yes, Stefano, the, the, the first two projects, they are uh, directed to a very broad audience. The first one is also directed to, to, uh, to, to public, since we, we are considering that the healthcare culture is not only be, uh, something for, for a doctor. We must spread this knowledge. Uh, the, the last one, the, the last use, the, the master uh, and also the digital education degree, they are, they are specific course for academics. So the, the first one, the master is also for, uh, for doctors, for, 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 for working people, for, uh, for, for nurses, technicians, and so on. The second one is a normal first level degree, three year degree. Thank you. Uh, so uh, let's move on. We will come back uh, with the discussion later. Uh, I suggest uh, uh, that Stefano De Nicolai, um, can you start uh, now? You can share your uh, presentation if you have one. Okay, uh, I have not a presentation, but I would like to share anyway a web link, if I can, okay. Okay. Just, just for the just for the introduction. Good. So you will share it in the chat. Uh, well, I can also try to share as a screen. Oh, Do you see? Yes, we can see it. So please, floor is yours. Okay. So thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for organizing the committee and to all the participants to this uh, very important. Uh, uh, digital workshop. Um, as I said before, I'm Stefano Nicolai. Um, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a member of the medical department. Um, I work in the Department of Economics and Management. Um, my interest is in the innovation management, the management of uh, new things within companies, organizational change and business transformation. Even though, yes, I am, I'm a particular interest also in the healthcare sectors, uh, in innovation teaching, uh, and uh, I'm also excited about uh, everything new uh, regarding the links between digital and teaching and learning. Uh, so um, let me start with my um, with my brief speech, uh, which is entitled "Teaching and Learning Healthcare Management." 
So it's about management, okay? Management of healthcare organization. And uh, in particular, what I would like to share with you is some insights, some lessons learned, some experience, some outcomes of our uh, research within the specific field of smart learning uh, and, and teaching innovation. Well, um, smart learning is not just, as, as you know, it's not just a remote working, is everything, uh, take the best and exploit the best you can, uh, digital tools, technological innovation in order to boost learning experience. And, and um, the ex specifically the experience that I would like to share with you today regard our master degree AMLOS, which is, um, um, which is uh, dedicated to top management uh, in healthcare. Uh, this is the website. And um, what is uh, pretty interesting is that we decided to keep the audience related only to top managers. Only to top managers, we have 30 um, people in class per year and they are general managers, they are uh, directors of administration. They are uh, social um, uh, healthcare uh, directors. Mm? Um, why I'm saying this? I'm saying this that because the audience is the first key point in my in my discussion. I can also stop sharing. So this is MLOS for who are interested is mlos.it. Um, we we are uh, leading these masters, and um, as you know, what happens last years uh, uh, it was that we have been forced to move to a digital platform basically overnight. It was a program totally told in presence, but um, not because we have not an experience in digital, because we have we have several other programs offered at least blended. Uh, via digital tools uh, in other areas. But, but um, because we started from the feeling that this kind of audience, top managers in, in, uh, in Elkers, general managers in Elkers, strongly feel the need of creating a community, of sharing ideas with other uh, peers. And... Um, they appreciated our lectures, but, but we really felt the fact that when they entered in the room, they were like kind of kids, <laughs> let me say, uh, because they, they enjoy to come back to school. They really enjoy the atmosphere to, to, to share things um, uh, with others and share insights um, out of um, room of the control. I mean, uh, often they sh they are in the same rule, uh, same room for other reasons because they are called for, uh, from our healthcare authority uh, to manage crises and this kind of stuff. But every times are very tough situation, very formal situation. While um, our master has become their, let's say, room for freedom, room, room to be, room to test, room to experiment new things and this kind of stuff. And you cannot forget this in, in designing the teaching program. You cannot forget this. And you will see uh, what I'm trying to say in, in, in the next part of my speech. Uh, my speech that I would like to organize in two parts. First, uh, a brief discussion regarding the key challenges that we faced during this unexpected event forced us to dramatically reorganize our teaching activities for these top managers in Elke. Then, um, in the second part, and the final part of my, my discussion, I would like to uh, share with you some solutions some lessons learned um, that we put into practice in order to react to such a challenges. Well, um, the free challenges, the, we face a lot of challenges, not just free, as many of you, I guess. 
Um, so I think that I'm going to say something that is likely to be quite popular. Uh, but, but if I had to select three key challenges that we faced last year during uh, the pandemic and reorganizing everything, um, I selected three. Um, the first one is the issue um, and the problems raised by the fact that these people, unfortunately, have a limited digital culture. As I said before, we already started offering uh, uh, courses online. Uh, we uh, experienced working with Zoom, WebEx, uh, um, and this kind of stuff, even before the pandemic, but with young people but with young people. And, and so we, we designed and we created an experience um, created around a particular mindset and we react to a particular request. So the third thing we learned is that what we uh, was good uh, and what we was thinking was best practices uh, wasn't. Uh, with, with, with people that from one side have a different age, uh, our, our attenders have about 50 years, some of them more than 60 years. You know, uh, I don't know in your countries, but in Italy, um, healthcare uh, needs a lot of experience, lead a lot of a long careers. And there are some, let's say, dynamics and, and mechanisms of power, let me say, according to which you can become the general manager of this organization only in the second part of your career. So let's say above 50 years or at least. And uh, they have a different culture. I don't want to say that they don't have culture because just to give an example, they created a WhatsApp group immediately by themselves. By themselves. So, so, so it, it is false. It is incorrect to say that they have not a digital culture at all, but for sure they have a di different digital culture. Just to give you an example, um, uh, breaking rooms. I guess you know what are breaking rooms. They are a way to, to create separated rooms, independent rooms uh, in parallel during uh, digital uh, um, seminars in order to create teams, discussing things, uh, putting to practice an exercise, um, our young students, uh, the, the master's degree in our university, literally love this. Uh, breaking rooms has been fa a failure with our uh, top managers. Okay, or at least they started appreciated this um, this method after uh, weeks or months after to recreating a new digital culture. I will tell you later on why in my opinion. But anyway, so there, there is an issue, first, of digital culture. Some of them, they have not a digital culture at all. And some of them maybe have a digital culture, but which is different. So what you learn with, um, with uh, digital teaching, uh, smart teaching, sometimes need to be dramatically adapted. The first key issue that we face the, is the issue of attention, issue of attention. So we are talking about, once again, general managers of healthcare. General managers of healthcare organization in the middle of a pandemic where a lot of people dying. So um, if you have that person in presence, they feel the kind of disconnection with their organization. So good or bad, they are out of their organization. If they are in front of the PC, they're continuously receiving a telephone call. They need to check their email account. And the problem is that this happened all to all of us. I'm sure 100% that even the tenders to this workshop checked the emails or checked some message in, 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 the, in the, smart, uh, the smartphone. I'm sure 100% that you, you, you now uh, already did something like that. Um, it's okay. It may happen. The issue is that they feel a particular urgency because of their role. So everything else is, is a priority because people are dying. But it, of, course, we, of course, we need to understand this. 
Of course. However, this is uh, uh, dramatically affecting the quality of lectures, interactions, and this kind of stuff. So you have to take care of that. You have to take care of that. The third key issue that we face is that how to keep the community alive. As I told you before, come on, let me be extremely frank with you. It was a kind of new kindergarten from them. Okay. And, and uh, they, they were literally thrilled and excited to come in, 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 in the classroom. We, we really felt a great enthusiasm. In, in attending our master. But a significant part of, of it was to be together in the same room, um, share faces, share uh, the, the same experience physically, the lunch time, networking, and this kind of stuff. So how to keep this condition alive um, also for top managers in the healthcare industry? Uh, well, um, you can probably think that these challenges are shared even for other situations, for younger people, for other sectors. But trust me, um, you can mention even other challenges. The, the list can be definitely longer. But I think that these three are particularly um, evident and strong in the case of managers in healthcare industry. So, so what? What we, what we can do to manage and to mitigate the, the problems raised by these challenges. Um, again, I would like to share with you um, uh, some, some best practices that we, we, we put in, into practice. Uh, the, first, the first one is um, we learned that you need to create a digital, I'm talking about digital, digital lectures. So something like what we are doing right now. Um, so you have to create a lot of dynamicity. Uh, you have to create a dynamic uh, schema. Um, so what, what I appreciate, for instance, of, of this workshop. So thank you so much, Sandra, to all the organizers that uh, you, you said, please, uh, just 15 minutes, no more than 20. And I hope that I'm already in delay, so I'm going to, to, to accelerate a bit. Um, because this is the time that works. Um, you have to show different person, different person, di different lecturers um, with no more than 15, 20 minutes. This is what we tested and learned, and we think that this is the perfect timing. Um, with 10 minutes, it is not enough to elaborate um, a strong message, especially for uh, experienced people, okay? You cannot tell stories to, to, the, to this person. The, you need to have something strong and in-depth concept. So you need at least 15 minutes. But after 20 minutes, even the best person, the, even the best communicator start entering in crisis with such situations. And also because, as I told you before, that person uh, started connecting with, with mobile phone, other emails. And, and so um, this is the timing that we thought that works. And we also experienced interviews. Interviews because um, instead of hearing Stefan Nikolai that blah, 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 for 20 minutes and recognize that after hearing myself for a while, it become boring and annoying. So sorry for that. But, but, but uh, an idea is to have two voices. So, so please, um, why don't you consider um, interviews? Okay, 20 minutes, but some questions. And you, so you create a break, you create dynamics, you, you have more voices, and you also you, you start creating the right feeling to other person to interact and make questions because you are in the flow. Okay? It is what already happening, questions and answers. So you are not breaking the rules, you are not breaking the flows. You're continuously, you're continuing the flow. So interviews, we face that if interviews works uh, very well. Interactions. 
I don't want to say a lot because I'm already in delay. So, so um, of course, interactions. But once again, taking into consideration um, uh, that uh, you have to adapt according mm, with regard to other similar situations. Like we say that breaking rules don't work or at least uh, you have to manage in a, in a different way, but you have not to forgot to also introduce some interactions. Questions and answers, but also experiences. Um, um, and also ask, ask this person to be a part of the lecture. What has been your experience in this? Would you add something according to your knowledge? Because they are very experienced people and they experienced an amazing adventure called COVID-19. So they, for sure, they have something to say that is useful, useful for everybody. So why we don't have to explore this resource? Third point, in my opinion, you have to strike the right balance between excellence, top excellence, and something out of the box at the, uh, at the extremes, at the two extremes. So from one side, something at the top, you have to offer something at the top because, you know, Healthcare lives on reputations, lives on star scientists. Reputation is super important in healthcare. Okay, so if you put in your lectures something super important, uh, it is very appreciated because they have to feel that the counterpart is super expert in the field. For instance, we organize a lecture with, 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 um, with uh, the vice president of Moderna, the head of the vaccine program, and, um, and but even in that case, he had only 15 minutes, 20 minutes. So, of course, you cannot uh, you cannot have every time the vice president of Moderna with you is difficult. I recognize that you cannot every single day uh, 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 a person like that. But you have to try to to from one side have super excellent people and with a strong reputation. And from the other side, at the opposite side, something completely out of the box because they need to, to think something different. They need to consider to enlarge their toolbox of skills with new skills, soft skills, but even more. For instance, creativity. We organize a seminar in order to explain them that creativity is not a trait, thanks to, the na to, to nature, that you cannot modify. Creativity is a skill, and as a skill, you can train your ability in creativity. Or uh, we offer them um, a lecture in uh, managerial improvisation. What happens if you prepare the speech and the person before you say exactly the same thing? How do you react? What do you do? It's very super important for top managers, and especially in healthcare. We, we, we recognize that the ability to be uh, agile and nimble is, is, is crucial, but they are not used to to think that this could be a thing that could be trained or, or, or teached. Or, or we also offered um, um, uh, a lecture on how to control your breath to manage stressful situation. They say, oh my God, I think that this is completely uh, useless. Uh, at the end, they say, thank you so much. It has been great. So this is what I say, this is what I mean with striking the right balance with uh, excellence, top excellence in healthcare, something which fit the best with their interest and with their sectors and something completely out of the box. This mix works a lot thanks to our experience. Um, finally, I have one final comment. Yes, please, um, finally, because we are a little I bit promise, down. I promise. A takeaway is means that, uh, uh, yes, of course, sometimes we have to do blended situation where there are people in presence and people remotely. Um, and I also like this situation, but we think that the best is to take your own way and, and one precise ways. 100% uh, remotely or 100% in presence because there are two completely different things. And so if you try to do both, you run the risk to do nothing. That's all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stefano, for a very 
live and sincere presentation. Uh, you were definitely struck at some point. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to ask you the question, but just, uh, just comment. If we take out this management uh, out of the picture and uh, put students there, don't you think we will have the same experience about lack of concentration, uh, need for uh, different things to be creative, to be innovative, to give them something out of the box? I think that your your experience can be adapted to to really large uh, number of people, especially to students. Well, let me say that um, uh, yes, you're right. I also said before that some of these uh, issues tools are shared with, with other situation, of course, of course. But uh, at the same time, I would say that they are more specific to this situation. Let me give an example um, with, with young students. I'm, I'm really straightforward in saying, okay, during my lecture, you cannot take a look on your smartphone. You're not allowed. Okay, just to give an example. And, and, um, beside, uh, and beside this announcement, beside to say this, um, there are some tricks in order to reduce the risk that they take a, uh, take a look on the smartphone. You can do that, not with a top manager. Because he, he, in healthcare, because he say, "Come on, Stefano, uh, be realistic. There are people that are dying out there. If they yeah. call me, I have to reply." Yeah, of course. It's just yeah, an example. Just an example. You are right. You are right. But but uh, the level of, of the challenge is to the next level. Is higher. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let's move on to the profession. So now we have Antonio, uh, so uh, who will share his experience and insight on uh, how this uh, continuing education can be really important. So Antonio, please, floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. I, I would uh, like to present our experience in uh, organizing the second level Master in Pediatric Orthopedics and Traumatology that we have done together with the University of Pavia, Professoressa Pedrotti and Dottoressa Elena, Elena Cardiola. And we have planned to organize this master in uh, two, uh, 19, uh, 2019, before our COVID. And we have mm -hmm. already decided to organize this master online in that period. And we, because uh, the organization was uh, for all Italian uh, orthopedic surgeon that not have the speciality in pediatric orthopedics because the request on the territory of the specialist in pediatric orthopedics was very large. So in this master, we have involved a, a lot of center in Italy and our goal is to train orthopedic speciality with a concrete presence of activity relating to pediatric orthopedic and not, so, not only pediatric orthopedic, but even traumatology. Discriminate between the pathological and physiological aspect of the pathology and is direct towards early diagnosis and was the choice of suitable treatment for pathology. In Italy, we, in Italy, we don't have a, a speciality school uh, of uh, pediatric orthopedics. So the, normally after the school of medicine, the orthopedics became a specialist in orthopedic and traumatology in general orthopedic and traumatology but don't have the, the skill in uh, pediatrics so the goal of, of our uh, idea was uh, in collaboration with the university of pavia myself because in that period i was the president of italian society of pediatric orthopedics now at the moment i am the past president of this society so to, the organization in, between the uh, Italian Orthopedic Society of Pediatrics and uh, Orthopedic Pediatric Center in all the country, we start with uh, this uh, our experience. It's a multi-speciality collection, inter-university collaboration, because uh, we involved a lot of uh, center, Pavia, Milano, Roma, Genova, and other five public hospital centers. Our master is, uh, it will be closed at the end of this year. And now I will show you in the next slide, in the next slide of the program. 
Okay, the teaching modules is a very large modules. It is 1,050 hours online lesson. And all the lesson was recorded so that the student can participate directly to the lesson or they can uh, learn in the night, in the Saturday, in Saturday, in Sunday when they have time. And this is the program that we have uh, um, organized. This was approach to the patient, pathology of even segment, uh, the, the spine, uh, the level, the, the foot, uh, the knee. And so we have speaking about uh, even uh, neoplastic uh, pathology, neuroorthopedia, pathology orthopedica, traumatology, and even uh, with the collaboration of uh, Professor Cima, who will speak at, uh, after me, about uh, the um, rheumatology, because in our department, we are on the same floor, there is uh, orthopedic and rheumatology department of pediatric, and even uh, pediatric rheumatology department of uh, uh, rheumatology. So this is the, our teaching modules. is a lot of uh, time because uh, 1,500 hours online is a longer period of uh, attendance. But after that, we have even organized the, the uh, practical, practical internship. So we have involved a lot of hospital in the country for the practical internship because we have divided the students in a lot of uh, small group. Uh, as, uh, we have uh, included 40 students in this year. 40 students because uh, start, we are starting with program 12, but we have received a lot of uh, adhesion. So we have asked to the university to involve all our 40 students and so we uh, has divided them in a, a lot of uh, center, Fondazione Dognotti in Milano, San Raffaele Hospital in Milano, Policlinico Tor Vergata Roma, Istituto Giannini Genova, Ospedale Pediatrico Roma, Abano Terme, Istituto Clinico Pini, Pavia, Istituto Città di Pavia, Ospedale Alessandro. All these are place specialized in you know, pediatric orthopedics in which the student can uh, make the practice uh, lesson and the practice experience with the patient. Now I let the uh, Professor Sachimat to speak about uh, the our organization in the this, uh, experience. Thank you. Yeah, thank you and uh, I congratulate uh, the organizers of this webinar and uh, also I thank uh, uh, Dr. Leveo for including me in his uh, master. Uh, I have to be only a teacher of this uh, uh, some modules because uh, uh, I deal with uh, pediatric rheumatology, which is strictly linked to pediatric orthopedics. So I gave some lessons, and uh, at the University of Milano, uh, there are the possibility of organizing uh, masters and courses postgraduate. So uh, we are thinking with Dr. Bereo to organize uh, something similar, but just from the University of Milano, not from the University of Pavia. And uh, we had a, a very large university in Milano, so uh, we are still in the planning uh, of, the, of the courses, which will be much smaller of the one that was organized by the uh, National Society. But uh, we hope to have uh, uh, many students uh, and uh, hopefully it can be a joint uh, venture between uh, rheumatology and uh, uh, orthopedics. So it was very interesting to listen to all the previous presentations. Thank you. Okay. This is our uh, experience and uh, we have uh, completed the, the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's very interesting and important. Uh, uh, maybe just to comment uh, uh, how important it is that uh, students gain uh, so much 
uh, experience, practical experience. I saw that you have included a number of hospitals. I think that is the, 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 the very important issue that they can gain experience in different institutions in practice. Yes, thank you. I, I agree with you because it's, it's difficult to learn something only online or only on the books. It is very important to have experience, practical experience. So we have uh, obliged the student to have this uh, uh, practical uh, theology. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I muted myself. And let's move now to our uh, last speaker, Stefan. So please, the uh, floor is yours. Uh, can you share with us your introduction? Absolutely, yes. Do you see my slide? Yes, we can see them. Okay, nice. So thank you for the invitation. My name is uh, Stefan von Ex, and uh, the purpose of uh, uh, my presentation, it will speak about, uh, I would say, conflict of interest between pharmaceutical industry and uh, clinicians uh, in the continuous medical education uh, session. So uh, first to start, uh, I would like to present myself very quickly. Uh, I am graduated in pharmacy and in uh, business administration. I am working in uh, the healthcare sector since 25 years. And uh, the five first years in the pharmaceutical industries and the last 15 years in the services companies. Uh, I was head of uh, companies supporting pharmaceutical companies uh, to communicate to the clinician thanks to promotional activities and medical education activities. Uh, I need to, to disclose myself, uh, my conflict of interest today. And I would say uh, I do not have conflict of interest because even if I am board member from several companies right now, uh, I do not have business connecting with medical education. Uh, but you have to know that uh, I am in contact uh, with more or less 40 pharmaceutical companies uh, right now. And uh, in the past, as I told you, I was head of uh, uh, a provider, a private provider uh, in Italy. So even if I will do my best today, and uh, even if I disclose that I do not have conflict of interest, uh, it's clear that my point of view is affected by my background and my history. So please, uh, your capacity and your ability to, to assess my content uh, today will be crucial because this is only my point of view uh, today. Let me start to uh, explain uh, very shortly and very quickly uh, what is the link uh, between uh, industry and clinician to introduce uh, medical education. Um, I would say that uh, uh, the main goal of the industry uh, is to uh, discover and to develop new entities, and then after to market uh, these new entities, these, these new drugs on the market. For the first, first step, you have to remember that uh, to develop a new drug, Right now, you need around 10 years and $1 billion. The development of the drugs is done thanks to the relationship and the partnership you will have with the clinicians. Because as you know, uh, to uh, produce all the clinical studies, you need the work from the clinician in the hospital. Second things, uh, to market a new drugs, you have to uh, uh, train, train before the clinician and the pharmacist. Uh, you have to explain a uh, new mechanism of, of action. You have to explain a new patient way. You have to explain what could be the adverse effects. That means that you, you need absolutely uh, to have uh, clinicians and uh, pharmacists and every kind of care opinion leader well-trained and exactly at the same level of knowledge 
uh, of what you have in uh, in the industry. It's why uh, you need to share continuously information, and you and you need as the industry to invest in continuous continuing uh, medical education. As I told you, $1 billion, 10 years to develop a new drugs. That means that uh, uh, industry has to find uh, capital and have to find uh, capital who want to risk, uh, of course. And this is where and when it could appear conflict of interest. That means that when the pressure from the capital is higher than the resistance from clinician and from the territory. And it is uh, quite clear. What is uh, the purpose of continuing uh, medical education? As I told you, is to maintain, develop, and increase the knowledge. Uh, and uh, you know, and to explain to you that uh, this is crucial uh, to develop and to market uh, new drugs. And uh, I checked last week when uh, uh, we had the first uh, medical uh, education uh, in the US, and it was in year 30. And uh, as you may see this publication, it was due to the mediocrity of this uh, initial medical training. Uh, so uh, it has been decided after to build up uh, guidelines and rules uh, to have a better level and less conflict of interest uh, to share information and uh, to do this uh, training uh, session. What is uh, the real uh, the value of uh, continuing medical education? Of course, all the session has to be accredited uh, in uh, all the countries, and there are uh, four steps, essential steps. The first one is to ensure that the content is valid. The second one is to prevent commercial bias. Uh, the third one is to uh, identified and mitigate uh, relevant uh, financial relationship. And the last one is to manage commercial support appropriately. Uh, there is, a, and fortunately, there is a difference between promotional activities and medical education activities. But is there a real value uh, every time? This is a good question. For example, I take the example of uh, Italy. There are uh, more or less uh, 1,100 uh, companies uh, organizing uh, continuous medical education or societies, I would say. 70% of this uh, uh, organization are private one. Okay, that means that uh, the, the goal for these companies is to do business. Uh, and uh, if we take an average of uh, 30 uh, sessions uh, for each of, uh, of these, that means that you have 30,000 uh, continuing medical education in Italy every year. Uh, it's impossible uh, to check for the authorities uh, all these sessions. Uh, so even if you are you have clear guidelines, uh, rules, and everything, it's quite impossible to avoid conflict of interest. You can only limit them. So at the end of the story, it's your own ability to check and to assess content and lecturer every time. That will give you the quality. I will... Uh, explain you my recommendations. This is my point of view um, for attendees and after for providers and then after for lecturers uh, to avoid uh, this kind of uh, complication and difficulties. Um, the first thing I think for, for the attendees, uh, I wrote that it's a little bit uh, pushed, but please be sure that there is a bias or a conflict of interest. So it's better to start with this, uh, uh, with that in mind. Don't worry about it, but you have to manage it. Uh, the second one is to check absolutely uh, who are the lecturers before uh, the training session uh, started. Google is a good starting point. 
you, you can use it, uh, putting the right keywords uh, into Google uh, with the name of, uh, of all the lecturers, and you will see what they have done in the past, not only the 12 last months, but the last five or 10 years, and you will see a publication if they are, uh, if they, they are linked with, uh, with the pharma industry or not. Uh, you have to know if people uh, get a fee or, or not, because this is, uh, uh, for me, a fact of, uh, uh, this is a parameter of quality. Uh, then, Baf then after checked the, the provider, uh, what kind of other programs is offering. Um, and finally, uh, concerning uh, financial grants, it, it has to be uh, disclosed uh, normally. Uh, even if uh, you see that there is a foundation or a scientific society uh, involved uh, granting this session, uh, please uh, do a double check. Uh, I prefer when you have more competitors uh, sponsoring the same event. Second thing is uh, recommendations uh, for provider. Uh, that means uh, what I have done in, uh, in the past, working uh, closely uh, with the industry. Uh, I would say the, the first point is to declare all the conflict of interest, even if minor. It's the best way. Transparency will always impact positively the attendees. So you will uh, enhance the, the quality of, uh, of your uh, session. Um, better to challenge content uh, if possible with uh, open end point of view. Uh, involve lecturer from different affiliations, not only from the, from the same scientific society, but from university, from institution, independent, uh, key opinion leader. Uh, declare clearly the origin of the financial resources uh, for the specific event. Uh, and declare if spokesperson are paid. At the end, uh, these are the recommendations for, for the lecturer. Uh, I think a lot of uh, students and uh, young people uh, should be uh, in, uh, in a couple of years also lecturer in a uh, session. I would say uh, quite the same thing, declare conflict of interest, even if minor and previous, not only the last uh, year, the last two years, but if you have had conflict of interest, declare it. Uh, as I have done uh, at the beginning of this session, introduce yourself by explaining clearly the context in which you are evolving, helping the attendees to understand better uh, what are your perspective and your point of view, because this is the problem is not only conflict of interest, it's objectivity of what you are uh, explaining. Challenge your content. Uh, that means uh, uh, try to challenge it uh, or with, uh, with other lecturers or, or with attendees. It's quite difficult uh, right now with uh, the virtual session. Uh, declare if you become uh, a fee for your performance. Uh, right now, today, uh, I don't get money for, for, uh, for this presentation, of course. Um, and I would say at the end, transparency uh, wins all the time. Take on message. Uh, I would say that, uh, as I told you at the beginning, the evolution of the industry is strictly connected uh, with the quality of the relationship with clinic. It's a kind of co-evolution. That means uh, no industry, no new drugs. No clinicians, no new drugs, no new drugs, no patient care. That means we have to work together. Uh, conflict of interest exists, will exist. Uh, they have to be clearly outlined and managed. Uh, I think... Uh, medical education uh, it's a good way uh, to keep uh, informed and well trained uh, uh, all the, the key opinion leaders and it's a good way to share information and uh, knowledge there are established procedures and uh, i think it's it's uh, 
uh, it's a winning situation. Uh, even if uh, there are accreditation, you you have to to be vigilant uh, and always challenge and check the content from the lecturers. At the end, transparency, transparency, transparency. It's always better. Okay. I finished my presentation. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, a very, very good uh, presentation. I have learned a lot and uh, really good uh, guidance uh, uh, how to present and how to organize uh, some events. Uh, I agree with you. Transparency is the most important issue. And if you have transparency, then everything else will somehow fit. Uh, 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 on the right places. So uh, Stefano has been very active and he has said a few questions. And so now we were speaking with you, so I will address you uh, with the questions, uh, a question from him. He asked, uh, are there differences in the attitude toward the conflict of interest in various countries or attitude is uniform? And the comment, a question, I really appreciated your suggestions to attendees. Indeed, you are proposing a personal proactive attitude of the attendees and personally evaluate whether or not there is a conflict of interest. Is this correct? So please. Yeah, uh, first sign, uh, difference between countries. I don't think there are difference between countries. I, I have only the experience from uh, France, US and uh, Italy. And uh, it's it's not due. The, the rules are quite the same in in all these countries. It's due to the fact that uh, uh, you have private uh, provider. Uh, they it's a, it's a business, and uh, to the other part, you have private partners. There are pharmaceutical industries. Uh, they have to do business. Uh, you have to think about the best way uh, to do all this business. That means, for me, trans transparency is a uh, key parameter uh, for this. But about the second question, I do not remember. <laughs> uh, second question is, um, um, in, are you proposing a personal proactive attitude of the attendees in, personal, uh, in personally evaluate whether or not there is a conflict of interest? Is this correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, let's see now, Professor Memeo, we have a question from you. Uh, Stefano is asking, what is the importance of distance instruments in the theoretical parts of your master's? Sorry, can, can you repeat? I, I understand the, the first okay, part so of the question. What is the importance of distance instruments in theoretical parts of your master? The importance is that with, with this instrument, we have involved all the country, all the people that are uh, joined with us from a place that are very, very far from here, so they can learn uh, uh, distance without coming in the university, without coming to the, in the hospital, and they have the possibility to learn uh, the experience from uh, all the professor of uh, kind of speciality, different speciality, and they come to the hospital just for the practical experience. So this is my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, very good. And uh, Stefano, uh, we have a question for you as well. Um, um, Stefano, your, the same name is Stefano Govoni, is asking Stefano de, uh, de Nicolai. So he asked, I think that you are underscoring the importance of the audience composition and the, build, and the building community is a key issue. In the case you presented, what is the relevance of recorded? Uh, in the case you presented, what is the relevance of recorded, recorded sessions, if any? So uh, please, can you, can you answer this question? Uh, Stefano, are you with us? I'm sorry. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, uh, did you see the question in the chat? Uh, it says... Um, the, the one of uh, Stefano? Yes. 
Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Well, um, it, it, it's a tricky answer because we record it. We record it. But to this side, it, it's a work in progress um, uh, process uh, because I have to say that um, only a few uh, take a look on take a look on recorded video. Okay. Uh-huh. This is related something to what we already say. They feel to have a very limited amount of time, their scarce attention. And uh, and so if there is one day where there is the, the, the lecture, they feel to be forced or anyway, there is a way to do that. If they have to find out the, the space in their agenda, in their time to review recorded lecture, they struggle and do that. I think that there is some way to, to improve from that point of view, but honestly speaking, is for us, is still a work in progress um, process. Mm. Okay, thank you. I think we, have, uh, we do not have any other questions so far from the chat. I think we can come to the conclusion uh, of, of this session. So maybe uh, for the end, um, uh, Tommaso, maybe uh, just uh, your point of view, uh, is the uh, distance, uh, is the continuing education uh, something uh, which is actually quite normal and is going to stay and how much it will influence uh, the healthcare industry as well? Okay, so <clears throat> uh, just be- before pandemic, uh, the, the continuing education uh, in medicine or in the, in the healthcare uh, environment was uh, very, very, very important. And also here in Italy, uh, I remember a conference from the ministry, uh, it's around 50% of the, of the programs were we are released as distance learning, as digital learning. Now, after the, the pandemic, I believe the digital learning environments in, in continuing in medical education will be at 100%. So it's, we cannot go back from, from this for continuing education in medicine. And a, and this will, uh, um, will need a very deep understanding of, of the processes from our side, so from the side of experts in methodologies and technologies, and also um, continuous relationships with the professionals to, to match uh, methodologies and needs from the, from the other side. And, uh, and this will, um, will influence a lot the profession, the, the, medic, the evolution of the medical profession in the future, I believe. So instant education or just in time or uh, uh, programs to, to reskill people, programs to upgrade skills, they will be the normality in the future. And they need to, 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 to establish a, a strong relationship also with industries, with, with pharmacologists, with pharmacology industries. To, so we in Italy, we had a, 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 a professional, we call it informatore scientifico, scientific uh, um, spreader. Uh, and this was a guy going uh, in, uh, in each uh, study uh, to meet each doctor just to, to present this new treatment or, or something like that. So this kind of, of, of professional will disappear. And the, the, the industries need to, to establish a very close relationship with the professional to inform, but to deeply inform on, on new treatments, on new uh, 
technologies uh, or new practice and so on. So I, I believe it will be a very, very uh, interesting field of development for digital learning in the future. Thank you, Thomas. So I think you have really very nicely concluded then, uh, this session. So in the end, I would like to thank uh, all of the speakers today, Tommaso Minerva, Stefano De Nicolai, Antonio Memeo, and Stefan Frenex, uh, for very in inspiring and, uh, and great uh, presentations. Uh, and I would just like to announce uh, that uh, the next session, uh, the next webinar, just let me uh, open it. Uh, it's going to be uh, on September 23rd. And the title is uh, Collaborative Online Trusted Relationships for Multicultural Exchange. So uh, I wish to thank uh, all of you for being uh, with us today and uh, see you next week. Thank you and bye. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.